This is Office Hours at Duke University. Today, Duke University professor David Rohde is taking your questions about partisanship in the upcoming elections. Rohde is the Ernestine Friedel Professor of Political Science here at Duke. In 2000, Rohde was named a Fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He is the author of Change and Continuity in the 2004 and 2006 elections and was a contributing author to the Oxford Handbook of the American Presidency. Back in 2006, Rohde said that the performance of then-President Bush was a key factor in those midterm elections. Tip O'Neill said all politics is local. Uh, well, they weren't local last night. The president and his performance were central considerations in the voting. To ask Professor Rohde a question, send an email to live at duke.edu, tweet with the tag Duke Live, or post to the Duke University Facebook page. You can watch today's discussion again anytime on Duke On Demand. Welcome to Office Hours. I'm David Jarmel, the head of Duke's Office of News and Communications, and I'm here with David Rohde. Professor Rohde, it's the Friday before the 2010 midterm elections. Uh, yesterday's Watch Washington Duke. Post On. said that anger and fear are going to be driving forces in the election. Is that what we're going to see on Tuesday? I think that's a fair analysis. Uh, uh, different parts of the electorate are driven by those two things. Uh, Republicans are extremely unhappy with the Obama administration and what they've accomplished and what they've tried to accomplish. And so the anger part is especially prominent among Republicans. Um, the fear part is more generalized in the electorate because of the state of the economy. Um, it has not improved as much as the Obama administration would like, but much more importantly, it's not improved as much as the electorate would like. And so they're scared uh, uh, about jobs, about retirement, uh, about uh, things like that. So both of those things are, are very strong forces in the election. Given the state of the economy, is a big defeat for the Democrats just inevitable, no matter what President Obama or anyone else does in this election? Big losses, uh, I, th I think, certainly were uh, uh, inevitable uh, given given the state of the economy. There's there's no stronger regularity in American politics, I think, than the fact that the president's party loses seats in a midterm. Um, only three times since 1900 uh, have uh, has that been not true. One was. Uh, the first midterm of the Roosevelt administration when people were still reacting to the Great Depression. Um, the second was uh, 2002 after 9-11 and uh, with stratospherically high approval ratings for the, for the president uh, because of that. And the third uh, was uh, after the Republicans tried to impeach Clinton. And, uh, uh, and so in 1998, the, the Democrats gained a couple of seats. Um, other than that, it's a regularity. The party loses. Uh, uh, the, the party in power loses bigger if the economy is in bad shape. And it's pretty proportional to the magnitude of how bad the economy is. So uh, a big, uh, bad midterm for the Democrats was 1966 when mm -hmm. inflation was rampant. Uh, because LBJ wouldn't spend tax to, to fund the war. Uh, 1982, the first midterm of the Reagan administration, Republicans lost a, a large number of seats because at, w when they already didn't control the House right. uh, uh, be because it was the largest recession then since the Great Depression. Right, uh, or you could have cited 1994 when President Clinton, after two years, uh, so, and the Democrats suffered a big defeat with New Gingrich and the contract with, with America. Right. And yet, two years later, President Clinton won a fairly decisive victory in the presidential election. That's right. And after the bad midterm of 82, uh, uh, Reagan won a landslide in 1984. Uh, so uh, there, are, there are no sure implications of this event for Obama's re-election. How that plays out depends on what happens in the next mm -hmm. two years. But the midterm is now, and the Democrats are in power. That's the uh, 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 the problem for the for the Democrats. Um, uh, and and this is very much in this respect a rerun of uh, of 1994. Um, uh, 
the, uh, the public r rates Republicans in Congress, their performance, lower than it rates Democrats in Congress. Right. But the Democrats control both the presidency and both houses of Congress. So the, if, we, if we draw the distinction between blame and responsibility, the public blames both parties. But the Democrats but have the, the responsibility. That's right. The Democrats have the responsibility, mm -hmm. and they're going to have to pay the price. Let me ask you, there was a CBS New York Times poll that came out, I think, a day or two ago that showed that uh, Republicans are making gains with, with women, Catholics, less affluent voters, uh, and other groups that President Obama and the Democrats had made a lot of inroads with, not just two years ago, but previously. Um, how, it, it, with those groups and perhaps others in particular, is this just a temporary change? Do you think this is more of a historic shift, a reversion? What, what's happening there? Well, uh, uh, we don't know for sure. Uh, uh, the, the electorate is always in evolution. Uh, groups are m moving in terms of their permanent alliances between the parties. Um, but uh, uh, many more uh, shifts in the electorate are temporary. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, as we've just said, you know, 1994, Democrats got creamed. 1996, many of the people who deserted them in 94 came home. Right. Um, and, and second thing is that the electorate is different uh, every time. So there are, there are, demographic trends that are working their way through the electorate. So the electorate continues to become less white. Uh, um, minority uh, share of the electorate uh, continues to grow and will, will continue to grow. So that will affect these factors. Uh, who decides to actually turn out? So right. one of the big problems for the Democrats this time around is that Democrats are not more strongly motivated than usual to turn out. Republicans are more strongly motivated. Yeah. And so we will have a disproportionate uh, share of Republicans in the electorate this midterm relative to previous midterms. We invite your questions for Professor Rohde, which you can send to us by email, by Twitter, by Facebook. And uh, Professor Rohde, we have an email question from Stuart, and he asks... Are the midterm elections more about the economy and jobs or more about how people view President Obama's initiatives thus far, especially health care insurance reform? I, I think the former more than the latter, although both are having an effect. So it is, uh, um, polling data is crystal clear on this. Uh, the proportion of people who say that the economy or jobs are a... Uh, ex uh, highly important or very important issue um, is 93%. Mm -hmm. uh, healthcare is 20 points less uh, than that, for example. Um, so, so the economy is what dominates the perceptions of the electorate, mm -hmm. and it is the failure of the economy to improve that is causing most of the problems for, mm -hmm. for the Democrats. Yep. However, mm -hmm. uh, it's also true that a number of the most important initiatives of the Obama administration, including health care, are not very popular. They're not hugely unpopular. Um, the latest data is that only a few percentage points more of the electorate disapprove of the health care bill than approve of it. Uh, but that's the whole electorate. Of those who will actually turn out, the disapproval range is right. larger. So let me ask you the follow-up question from Stuart, um, which is, are, are people, um, well, he says, are Americans voting this time on the basis of good information or just a lot of myths spread on the internet? So I guess the, the question is, is this their, their own actual personal economic experience or experience with healthcare, or is it stuff that they're watching on television or elsewhere? Well, it's both. Uh, uh, pe people are moved most profoundly by their own experiences. So, for example, people in the electorate who are, people who have lost their jobs will not vote in as great a number as people who are still right. employed. So, so the people who are actually unemployed will not have as big an impact on the electorate as, than people who are in fear of losing their jobs, who, who, who wonder maybe they'll be next in the next year or two. Um, and 
people who are in that situation, are prof their vote choices are profoundly affected by, by those evaluations. Um, but also people are affected by what their perception is. Uh, so the health care bill, for example, there are a lot of provisions of the health care bill that people are unaware of or think, things people say they would like in a health care bill that are in fact in the health care bill yeah. but they don't realize we're in the health care bill. And, uh, yeah. um, and so, so that's a problem. Well. Let me change gears a little and ask you about one of the most interesting features of this election season, which has been the Tea Party, uh, really going back to the primaries. And, of course, the Tea Party um, um, achieved some major victories in states across the country, in Kentucky, Alaska, Delaware, and so forth. Um, they may or may not do as well in the general election. Um, but looking beyond Tuesday, how much part of the political landscape do you think the Tea Party is going to be? I think that's... That's very hard to say right now. There, um, the Tea Party has largely become incorporated within the Republican Party. Uh, it didn't necessarily start out that way, uh, but it's it's true uh, now. And so, the effect that the Tea Party has in the future will primarily be felt, I think, within the Republican Party. On the other hand, if there is in fact a substantial uh, independent candidacy f in two, uh, 2012, or uh, some proportion of them could be drawn into that, and that could have an effect. You mean for the presidency? For the presidency. Now, there's been talk of Michael Bloomberg, the mayor of New York. Is there anyone else that you could see doing this? Uh, I, I can see a, a number of people potentially doing it. Uh, 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 thinking of people who might have a significant effect is, is much different. Uh -huh. uh, Bl you, Bloomberg is exactly the kind of person who might have a temporary impact, that is, have mm -hmm. an impact in, in one election, and that's because he has enough money to fund his campaign yeah. himself. Right. Uh, the big, one of the big problems for independent candidacies, and then even more for third parties, is that uh, getting the resources to compete uh, is very difficult. Overcoming the legal hurdles uh, that shore up the uh, the, uh, the two party system, uh, those are also great hurdles in that. So, yeah. so Bloomberg is somebody who could potentially have an impact. Let me ask you. You, you raise. Uh, let me ask you a follow up question now about money, since you're, you're you're asking about money. So one of the distinctive features of this year's race in 2010 has been that even though the Democrats reportedly have, are spending more than the Republicans in some of the most important House races, that that spending apparently is being far surpassed by spending by independent third party groups, which have been primarily on, on the Republican and, and, and right side of the political spectrum. Um, what's been the impact of that, and how do you see this playing out going forward? Well, uh, the f first thing to say is, is that studying money in campaigns is very complicated. Uh, um, so we, might, we might think first about there are sort of three major pots of money. There's candidate spending, so the money that candidates raise as individuals and then spend on their campaigns. In that portion, Democrats are in much better shape than Republicans uh, this time around. In, because the, the Democrats who are in trouble are incumbents, um, Republicans are challengers, uh, incumbents can raise, in almost all circumstances, a lot more money than, yeah. than them. Uh, second is party spending, um, which is independent by law of uh, candidate spending and, um, and has grown in importance over the last decade or two. Uh, and there... The different party campaign committees are in different positions relative to one another. So, for example, the Republican National Committee, th their spending has dropped enormously. Uh, Democratic National Committee has gone up substantially. This is partly a function of the Democrats taking over the White House, yeah. but, but not completely. Um, the, then there are the party committees of the House and the Senate, and the Democrats are... Uh, better off than the Republicans, but the Republicans are a lot better off than they were in that, uh, in that respect. And then third, there are the independent non-party groups that, that you referred to, and th this has been particularly affected by a Supreme Court decision 
um, uh, almost a year ago now, uh, uh, Citizens United versus FEC, which stated that corporations have the same free speech rights as, as individuals, individuals and therefore by extension they have the same right to spend money and so uh, so a lot of these what are, uh, 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 new independent groups are raising large amounts of money from individuals who are you know, anonymous yeah and so rich ind individuals and corporations and uh, other groups are funneling money into the, the campaign. In that portion, the Republicans are substantially better off than the Democrats, but the Democrats' uh, share is, is far from trivial. So prob the, the latest estimate I saw was that about 60% of that money is supporting Republicans, about 40% mm. of it is supporting Democrats. Mm. And, and and the, so independent spending for the Democrats is $200 million, and yeah. for Republicans, $300 million. You're watching Office Hours. Uh, we invite your questions, which you can send by email, by Twitter, by Facebook. And Professor Rohde, we have an email question from George, who asks, how has early voting changed the way politicians campaign? Um, it's... Uh, extended and intensified the campaign. Um, uh, so uh, uh, the candidates have to worry about things that happen much earlier in the campaign, much further before the uh, November election day than they used to have to. Um, because uh, 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 that once a person has cast their ballot early, even if they change their mind, that uh, that vote uh, stays in place. Right. Um, um, the get out the vote, what's called the ground game, so which focuses on uh, get out the vote, turn out, uh, uh, contacting voters, uh, it has extended further back in time and a, a much larger share of resources is going um, to that now. And uh, uh, because a larger and larger share of the electorate is is casting their ballots early. Right. There was a piece, I believe, in the New York Times a couple of days ago that was saying that um, where the hypothesis was that early voting would increase the number of people who vote. In fact, that may not be happening, and it may be diffusing some of the enthusiasm because it's dissipated from Election Day, um, and that it may be having, to some extent, the opposite effect. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I, I, um, I saw that the, 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 the analysis was produced by a couple of political scientists at Wisconsin, who yep. I know, uh, uh, and, and it's, it's plausible. Um, one of the key findings that, that they put forward, and a lot more analysis is necessary on this subject than could be presented in that short piece, is that uh, this uh, less than strong effect, I don't think that's the best way to put it, from early voting is not the case in states that also have same-day registration, mm -hmm. uh, North Carolina being one of those. Right. So there was a very substantial increase in participation in North Carolina uh, in, in 2008 as a result of early voting. And so if more states would move to that system, uh, coupled with the early voting, then that might increase it, the number it, of people it, who vote. It almost certainly would increase. So let's jump ahead. Um, we're, we're talking now uh, a few days before the election. Um, some people may be watching watching our discussion after the election. But in any case, the last couple of years in Washington it seems to have been a lot of gridlock. If the um, predictions prove true uh, after Tuesday, the Republicans seem likely to take control of the House of Representatives, less likely, but possibly even the Senate. Um, of course, President Obama, a Democrat, will still be in the White House for another two years. Um, will the gridlock get even worse? Um, you know, not to mention down the street at the Supreme Court, you've got uh, a five to four, or, you know, a fair amount of gridlock there. Is, is our federal government just kind of hopelessly gridlocked at this point? Or do you think things are going to change if the Republicans do take one or both houses? Well, that's it's a very complex question question. Um, and the reason it's complex is that it depends very heavily on first the particulars of, of the outcome of the election. 
um, but secondly, about the strategic choices of the various uh, actors in, in this process. So if, if it goes that the, so the Democrats lose the House, uh, they narrowly hold on to the Senate, um, uh, then there's, there's first the necessity of some cooperation. There are some things that the, uh, uh, just from a selfish political interest, uh, each party is going to have to participate in. Um, but there are also a, a, a very high expectations, very strong preferences uh, in these respective groups. So one of the big things is what, what's going to be the particular configuration of the Republican conference in the House? And uh, what, is, what are the new members going to demand of their leadership in putting forward legislation. The House acts first on most legislation. So if the Republicans take the House, most legislative initiatives will start with the House. Uh, taxation must start in the House. Uh, 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 appropriations by tradition start in the House. Uh, uh, when we had this situation in, after 94, the, the Republicans tried to do a lot of policy change via the budget and the appropriations process, and mm -hmm. it ended up in the government shutting down twice. Right. And that was catastrophic for the Republican standing in the country. Right. There are Republicans who are running for office this year who are so opposed to the Obama administration's initiatives, including health care, that they're advocating shutting down the government as a matter of policy. Yeah. Just as, as that's part of their platform in right. order to block the implementation of the health care so plan. So beyond that sort of generically, are, are there like two or three issues that our viewers might keep their eyes on as we move in past the, past the election and into the new Congress? Of course, we had a big fight over health care and economic reform in this past session. What, what should they be watching? Are there certain issues? Well, I think w one is health care, what, what the Republicans try to do to prevent implementation or to repeal uh, uh, health care. Uh, secondly, uh, the budget will loom very large. It is, it is part, uh, perhaps the, the thing that ties the, uh, the Republican base together more than anything else is that government has gotten too big, spends too much, taxes right. too much. And so if they are to implement a downsizing of government, they're going to have to come forward with hundreds of billions of dollars in cuts. And uh, uh, trying to do that at the same time as not alienating the electorate who supports the idea of reducing the federal budget deficit but may not support the specific things that need to be done to reduce the budget deficit. Right. So, for example, the, you know, most, most of the federal budget goes to uh, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. Uh, any effort to uh, uh, reduce uh, the deficit, especially without raising taxes, which is an article of faith with the Republicans, uh, uh, is going to have to do something about Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid. Yeah. Let me ask you a question that we've gotten actually two similar questions from, from our viewers, Professor Rohde. Um, as, as we watch this battle uh, play out after, after the elections, uh, between the White House and the new Congress that presumably is going to be more conservative um, in the next session. Uh, Howard and Molly ask a similar question. Molly says, how much do you think racism has played a role in President Obama's legislative limitations since he's been in office? Well, uh, studying racism and its impact at the individual level is very difficult, uh, and it's certainly not my specialty. Um, and, uh, and so it's, it's hard to be sure. However, I would say that were Barack Obama white, and had he tried to do exactly the same things under exactly the same circumstances, he would have had exactly the same problems. Um, that, that is... Uh, and so that's not saying that racism plays no role in this, but that, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the president and the Democrats have tried to 
change policy in significant ways. Anytime you try to change policy, you're going to alienate a large portion of the electorate, most especially people in the other party, mm -hmm. and they're going to try and stop you. Uh, and, uh, and that's the story of this administration. They tried to make big changes on important issues, and the Republicans tried to fight them. Mm -hmm. How about the concern about the lack of civility within Congress? I think this has been talked about, especially within the context of the Senate, um, of uh, Lindsey Graham, the Republican senator from South Carolina, for instance, has proposed people getting together for lunch and other things just to force Democrats and Republicans to interact uh, more, more often with each other, to bring back some sense of common purpose. Do you have any thoughts of where, where anything's going to happen with that? If the question is, do I think civility is going to get better in the Senate? No, I don't. Do you think uh, it'll get worse? I think that there's a, probably a good chance it'll get worse. It partly mm -hmm. depends on the outcomes of a, a, a subset of this election. So the, the, the more of the people who were supported by the Tea Party that get elected, the worse I think it will get. Um, I don't think that getting together occasionally for lunch is is going to have a, a big effect. The Senate has changed enormously over the last four decades in this respect, and uh, it's very different. I worked there for a year. Um, uh, it was a very different place in this regard, as, as was the House. Um, and, uh, I mean, first of all, uh, members don't have a lot of personal contact with one another anymore. They used to have a lot more. This is more than anything else driven by the need to raise money. Right. Um, and the, the competitiveness of elections and that, so that uh, senators spend a lot of time away from the Senate chamber either trying to raise money for the millions and millions and millions of dollars they have to spend on their campaigns, or they're back home the district, yeah. trying to talk to uh, uh, to voters, mm -hmm. and so all of that time, they uh, uh, they can't spend interacting with one another. So they don't see each other in social situations much mm -hmm. anymore. Um, uh, second thing is that they really are polarized on policy views. In that, I mean, this this is the 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 two parties stand for different things in a much clearer way than was true 30 or 40 years ago. And, uh, and so uh, the, uh, the, each party has a large share of their members who think that what the other party is trying to do is terrible for the country. Yeah. That, that is, they honestly feel that. Well, it's much harder to get along well with somebody who you think is setting out to destroy your country. <laughs> right, right. So you're, I mean, you're saying this is not just atmospheric. There's a, there's a really important substantive core to this difference, and, I, and you don't see that going away I, anytime I, soon. Well, I think, it's, I think it's both things. That is, it's, some of it's atmospheric, and some of it is, is really about policy, and I don't see either one of those going. Yeah. So there's a line of argument that, although one might think that if um, it would be a big loss for the Democrats and for the president uh, if, if the Republicans win as big as they seem likely to win in the House and maybe even in the Senate. Um, but there's a counter argument that says actually that would be a good thing for President Obama because it gives him a foil or it, it um, puts new pressure on the Republicans to work together and to try to find more common ground. How do you see that playing out? I, th I think there is a, a lot to that, and, and indeed this goes back to what we were just talking about in, in relation to 1994. A, a, a couple of my colleagues and a few of our graduate students were working on a project comparing 1994 to 2010, um, and I, I see there are great parallels here, and, and one of the things is, as, as we said, the, the Republicans so the Republicans hadn't controlled the House of Representatives in 40 years when they, when they won in 1994. There were many, many, many things they wanted to change about public policy. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the things that they wanted to change were not, didn't necessarily resonate with the whole American electorate, although it, it cert they certainly did with the base of the Republican Party. And lots of the new members were strongly committed to 
to to making these changes and um, and completely impatient with any effort by the Democrats to slow down the process or block uh, what uh, what they were trying to do, and so the public perceived that the Republicans were trying to go too far and that President Clinton was being much more reasonable. The president exercised his veto. The Republicans shut down the government and the public sided with the president. And so when it came time for Clinton to run for re-election, um, uh, his approval ratings were very high. Um, and then they got even higher when, when the Republicans tried to impeach him and remove him for, uh, from, right. from office. And Clinton left office as one of the most popular presidents in American history right. in terms of, uh, of approval. So, so we could see the same kind of thing happen. Right. But it's not inexorable that the Republicans could make different kinds of strategic choices mm -hmm. and avoid alienating the electorate by, mm -hmm. by doing things that the public perceived was too extreme. Right. And then the implications for re-election for, for Obama would not be as clear. Yeah. So, and at the same time that President Obama uh, and the Republicans and the, and the entire Congress may be searching or not for this new middle ground, um, as we saw with Obama's appearance on The Daily Show a few days ago, he's going to continue to face pressure from his base um, where Jon Stewart was was teasing him about, you know, yes, we can, but, um, and the implication being that uh, the president's been too quick to compromise, that he hasn't stood up as much as he should for progressive causes, despite an, anything he's done with health care and in other, other arenas. Um, putting aside the merits of, of any of that legislation that's still out there on in, in energy and immigration and some of the other big ones that are still waiting to be addressed, if just in terms of pure politics, if you were advising President Obama, is he is he better off um, worrying? I mean, should he be worrying more about his base, or should he be thinking more about um, in the middle and, and winning back independence? Well, I think I think more about the middle and uh, and independence. Uh, this might be a different story were the situation not so dire for the Democrats now. Um, and so uh, in that circumstance, analogous to Jimmy Carter, for example, that he might have to worry about a, an insurgency from the left in the Democratic Party. Yeah. And and it's still talked about. And that, uh, a, a reporter was talking to me the other day about uh, Howard Dean running against Obama. Um, I, again, given the circumstances, I doubt that that would be a problem for Obama. Uh, a, a much greater problem is the shift of independence and women away from the Democratic Party in this election. Yeah. And that's, if, if Obama is to be reelected, and, and even more so if Obama is to be able to do anything after he gets reelected, um, then that, that's the segment of the electorate he has to be concerned about because, um, I mean, the, the Democrats in 2000 and after 2008 were in a really strong position. They had a substantial majority in the House of Representatives, a larger than normal, almost veto or a, a filibuster-proof majority in, right, the, until Scott uh, Brown's in, election. in the right. in the Senate. And despite that, there were many things that the administration wasn't weren't able to get through Congress. In right. that. So, so the ability of the administration to, to have the numbers to accomplish anything is uh, is going to be it's going to be much more difficult uh, after Obama's reelected. To, to take one example, in regardless of what happens in the midterm in two thousand and twelve, a, a about two-thirds of the Senate seats that are up are Democratic Senate seats. So even if the Democrats hold on to the Senate this time, it will be very unlikely that they'll hold on to the Senate they'll after, have some tough races. after 2012. Right. And, and so the president, even if he wins back the House, very likely will, will lose the Senate if, hmm. he have, if they don't lose it this time. Right. And, um, and so, uh, uh, again, great great problems and that's it. So, so the left wing of the Democratic Party is going to have to say, uh, you know, regardless, regardless of what the president puts forward and regardless of, uh, of how he argues for it, 
uh, he's just not going to have the resources to do more than he did in his first two years. Right. So let's just play some politics. Let's look at, we keep talking about two years from now in 2012 and the presidential election that you're, you, you're saying you think it's probably unlikely that, um, that, you, um, well, that someone would challenge Obama, but in any case, he's likely to be the Democratic nominee again. So let's have, let's have some fun on the Republican side. What, uh, what's in your crystal ball? Who do you see emerging as the, as the Republican nominee? My, my crystal ball is very, very cloudy in that. Uh, I, I think that nomination races, uh, as we write about uh, uh, in every uh, election, are, are very complicated and very difficult to predict because, uh, as, as my colleague and co-author John Aldrich has shown, uh, uh, momentum in an election has a, a nomination race has a very big impact, and so uh, um, it can turn on on very narrow victories in very small events. New Hampshire, Iowa, right. the, uh, those sorts of things. So, how, who thought that Obama was going to be the Democratic nominee? And I'm this far ahead of, right. of that. You know, almost nobody. Uh, um, uh, so, uh, we did not regard it as the quixotic uh, effort that a lot of people were saying, but that it was an improbable. Right. Uh, uh, right. So effort. all the names we're hearing now, Sarah Palin, Mike Huckabee, Tim Pawlenty, and others, I mean, you're saying it could, maybe them, maybe somebody else. That's right. Maybe somebody whose, whose name isn't prominently mentioned. I mean, one person that's been talked about is Rick Perry in, mm -hmm. of, of Texas, the governor of Texas. Right. Uh, we know from experience that governors of Texas uh, can be big players in pre presidential races. Um, Sarah Palin, and that, what happens with the Tea Party? What does does it continue to grow? Does it rally behind her? I mean, Carl Rove said just a couple of days ago that she doesn't have the stuff necessary to be president, and that so there'll be, you know, internecine strife in the Republican Party. We'll see if she party. has the stuff to win uh, to win the, the the election in Alaska. That's she'll, uh, she'll to get past that. Right. So uh, let's play a game. I'm going to um, give you a name. I'm going to ask you to be that person, and you have to tell me in one sentence. Um, when January rolls around, like what's what's the biggest thing you're worried about or your biggest objective? So if you're Barack Obama and it's January and this election plays out as you think it will, going forward, what's your biggest objective? Biggest objective? Mm -hmm. that, well, for, for, that's easy for re-election for Barack Obama and and uh, and much of his attention and his strategic choices are going to be faced. Uh, are going to surround that, and and uh, uh, how how does he advance that cause? Bec and, and this is not necessarily out of selfish interest, and in that he he must believe that in terms of policy, the country will be better off if he stays as president than if a Republican replaces him. So okay. so that just just for that reason, he'll have to focus on real. And if you're John Boehner, who may become the new Speaker of the House, what's your objective? Holding together my conference. Uh, um, that's going to be a, a challenge. Uh, um, you know, it's a again going back to '94. It's a little known fact that uh, the one member of the Republican leadership in the House of Representatives who argued against shutting down the government was Newt Gingrich. Yeah, and he was he said privately at the time that he had to go along because if he had stood up and tried to block it, he would have been. Out mm -hmm. as, as speaker in, in no time. So, and if, so if, holding together the disparate elements of the conference and and getting them to emphasize a long-term perspective rather than a short-term perspective. Two more. If you're Harry Reid, you hold on to your seat, you beat Sharon <laughs> Engel, you're still you're still the head of the Senate. What's your objective? Uh, the, uh, the objective for Reid is to it, a combination of two things, to help advance the cause of the Obama administration and getting it reelected, but even more importantly, to do things that will foster the best possible electoral environment for this large class of Democrats. This mm -hmm. could be up for reelection in 2012. And if you're Mitch McConnell, the Republican leader in the Senate from Kentucky, who has not been very cooperative with the White House, what's your objective? I think that depends in, in in part on whether or not he's the majority leader or the minority leader. Mm -hmm. If he's the minority leader, then very much the strategy that we've seen uh, 
uh, so far. Uh, it, it'll, it'll be carried forward because the responsibility for the agenda will still rest with the Obama administration. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and he will be trying to undermine the Obama agenda and advance the cause of taking over the Senate in 2012. If he's the majority leader, then he has to, again, focus on uh, uh, the agenda in a way that he wouldn't have to as, if he's the minority leader and worry about what will be the implications of his behavior uh, in reacting to the things that the House sends over, reacting to the proposals of the Obama administration, and then look, it, it, those things looking forward to, to 2020. Right. So you are a political scientist. You've been studying um, elections for many years. Uh, I have an email question from Jeremy. We have a couple of minutes left in the broadcast. So let me ask you more of a personal question. And Jeremy asks, how do you research and study elections without taking sides? Actually, I've always found that very, very easy. Uh, uh, part, partly, uh, it's not that I don't have strong personal opinions, and I do, and uh, and uh, among family and, and things like that, I, I can voice them uh, uh, strongly. But um, uh, I'm I'm interested in understanding politics. That's that's my motivation, and that I. I I made a decision a long time ago, uh, uh, early in my career, that I was going to mainly be an analyst and not a participant. And so mm -hmm. there are many things that, that I, I haven't done in terms of participating in campaigns or, or taking positions. I don't put bumper stickers on my car or, or things like that. But uh, so, so in order to understand things, your positions are irrelevant. Um, um, you know, I'm a scientist. I, as I tell my students, every every class I start with the same thing. I'm a scientist in the same sense a physicist is. Right. Uh, I know on election night I'm planning to make a long night of it, and I'll be watching. And um, I'm just my last question. So I know you're teaching a class that night, but uh, tell us what you do on election night. Uh, I, I uh, once I get home from class, I'll set up my, in front of the television set with my computer. Uh, I, I try to get as many information sources together as, as I can, and that's so we have multiple televisions. I'll have different stations on, and on the, uh, I'll be switching back and forth between different websites. I'll have all of my paper sources laid out in front of me. And For someone like you, this, this must be heaven. It's election night. Well, again, as I say, I, I'm, I am not without my personal uh, preferences in this. So uh, uh, the actual outcomes are, are both interesting from an analytical point of view, but it, good or bad from a personal point of view. Right. So it's not always heaven in that, but it's always interesting. And, and elections like this in particular are more interesting than most. Uh, for those of you who are watching from here on the Duke campus, uh, we wanted to let you know that the day after election on, on Wednesday, November 3rd, from 4.30 to 5.30 p.m., uh, there's going to be a special session with Frank Hill, the former chief of staff for Senator Elizabeth Dole, and Pope Mac McCorkle, who is an adjunct professor at the Sanford School and a political consultant, and they will be discussing the implications of the 2010 midterm elections. You can find the details about that on the Sanford School website. Professor Rohde, thank you so much for joining us. We'll all be watching uh, on My Tuesday pleasure. and beyond to see, to see how this turns out. Um, thank you for joining us on Office Hours. Uh, a reminder that you can watch this broadcast uh, on Duke On Demand um, and as well as many other videos from Office Hours and other programs here at Duke. Thank you for watching. Watch Duke. On Demand. Ondemand.duke.edu This week on Duke On Demand, Duke students stage the play Beatification of Area Boy in consultation with the drama's Nobel Prize winning author. They wanted to know references in the play. What did this refer to? Uh, what's the background to, uh, to this? Also this week, the Duke women's soccer team dons pink jerseys for breast cancer awareness in a win over Boston College. Comedian Jeff Foxworthy and his wife Greg receive a Duke Medicine Honorary Alumni Award for their support of Duke Children's Hospital charities. And an office hours conversation on how brain science is affecting court trials.
Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.